tickets, you were talking about those supporters who were on the plane wondering whether they got tickets for the way in. A couple of points to make. There were fans who used to come to watch Ricky Hatton who got on the plane with no tickets and knew they weren't going to get tickets and knew they couldn't afford to get tickets from a scalper or a tower. And they would buy tickets to watch it here on the cinema. They would enjoy the week in Vegas and then watch it. It's it's on half a dozen cinemas around here. That's what some of those will be doing. And and they will clamour to get to the weigh-in because for them, that will be the live event of the week. But also I was talking to um, Lance Pugmire today from the uh, Los Angeles Times. He was saying that as of last week, there were 7,000 tickets unsold. Now, just to remind you, the cheapest ticket is $500 face value, up to $10,000 ringside face value. Now, if you go on the T-Mobile Arena ticket site, they come up at the dearest tickets going at the moment. There are two of them for 107,000. Now, as against- On their own site? It guides you immediately to, to, to a secondary agency, but it's a line to the T-Mobile Arena. If you go on the arena to look for tickets, this is where you wind up. Now, those $500 tickets are selling for around $1,300, which is kind of two and a half times face value. That surprised me that they're they're not really flying off the shelves, Steve. And and, and just comparing it back to Mayweather and Pacquiao, those... That was a big story. The ticket was a big story for for Pacquiao and Mayweather. Well, one of the the problems with the Mayweather-Pacquiao fight was the tickets weren't given to the buyers until so late that some of those buyers didn't even turn up and so hotel rooms all around Vegas became vacant during fight week. So they they got that wrong and and they made sure they're not going to do that this time. And we could could see that the tickets becomes one story this week. Uh, I would say the tickets become one story this week and one or two of the other days that we mentioned, the grand arrivals, the head-to-head and obviously the way and they take care of of, of themselves. But I'm wondering, Mike, and and I'm not being facetious, at what point do you think we might start talking about the fight itself, what might happen? Because I actually think that the mixed martial artist fraternity, either the UFC fighters or some of the other MMA fighters, and the press, and bear in mind, since June now, I've been doing hits on Five Live with various Americans and various British guys. They've got far more aggressive. They've got far more confident. They've got far more bullish. They started off talking about you know it's a big jump it's a massive ask it's a massive risk and I did some I did some stuff last week on Thursday on Five Live with two people who, who, who gave up with it's a risk it's a this they were talking specifically about the victory yeah. they have become bullish Mike yeah and it's an echo chamber Steve and, you know, and, and as I said right at the start of the podcast that this, this is often what happens on fight week when a fight's announced like this one Mayweather was such an overwhelming favourite then you start to look at how on earth can he be beaten? And so the, the two trains of thought come closer and closer together. And I think you'll find as, as we go on through the week, look, there are elements I will listen to, Steve. First of all, he's 40, he's been out of the ring for two years. Somebody who fights like he does, who's so dependent on reflexes, you know, if those margins are diminished, yeah. where he would make a Pacquiao miss by half an inch, if that margin has gone, then he's being hit on the chin. But is McGregor good enough to do that? Another element I'll listen to, I was sat here ringside watching him struggle at times against Marcus Maidana because Maidana just tried to turn it into a brawl. Although even within that fight, Steve, there were times when Mayweather stood his ground like he used to do in 2000, 2001 against Diego Perales and just could not miss Maidana. You know? And that's what we're talking about here. That's the kind of template and I will also, you remember going back to your days at Fitzroy Lodge in South London, Steve, when, you know, Mick Carney, your old trainer, or you would spar with a raw novice. Mick Carney yeah. might say to you, take this kid around, just, yeah. just, just show him a few things, Steve, look after him. And suddenly he would throw, I mean, you remember at my club, Steve, Derek Angle went on to awesome. fight for a World yeah. Cruiserweight title. Cruiserweight. Well, at, at one stage, I was weighing about nine stone. He turns up at the club as this rough 14-year-old, weighing about 19, nine stone. And... Uh, and I was asked to take him around. And he just suddenly threw this right uppercut from absolutely nowhere. And it, like, it stunned me. And I just thought, where on earth did that come from? You know, and it, there, so it, there, there is that kind of chance that McGregor would do stuff that's so unpredictable that, that 
that Mayweather might not read that. Mayweather would read anything that's conventional that he's seen before. But see, see I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't disagree with that. I, I completely agree. But I do find it slightly insulting, this idea that Mayweather has never met a boxer yeah. like McGregor yeah. before. Because, yeah. because you know, this guy went to the World Amateurs when he was six, 16 or 17. Yeah. I think he went illegally, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you know, out in Berlin. And suddenly, you know, he was fighting guys there. So let, let's say he came up against a Cuban there with free calm because a, free, a Cuban with, with normal yeah. arms doesn't go yeah. onto the boxing program. Yeah. Um, and and then, all the way through his pro career and his amateur career, and both in sparring and in fights, he fought all kinds of guys. Yeah. He fought all kinds of guys. And to yeah. go back to something I said at the top of the program, having watched some of McGregor's victories um, in the octagon, in the UFC octagon, and because uh, over the last few years, you watch the amount of corny of you are. You don't stay up till four o'clock with a popcorn to watch yeah. him live or five yeah. o'clock, but you yeah. catch it, you catch a clip. Yeah. But I studied them a little bit this afternoon, and I, 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 he's actually less impressive as a boxer than I thought he was. He's actually gone down in my estimation as I know, a boxer. But I, you see, I, I can't quite get my head around it, Steve, because I don't watch UFC and MMA, so it's so difficult to try to transfer what he's doing in those UFC fights to a, to a boxing ring. Yeah. I mean, one thing that struck me straight away is that he's very, very awkward going backwards. Yeah. So if Mayweather was to step on the front foot or even just hold his ground in the centre of the ring, this is not even a contest, yeah. but it's it's how Mayweather decides to play. And and uh, so it, so it stick me. I'm so it stick. I'm now a UFC uh, expert hat on again. <laughs> but that whole loss just last year to Diaz to Nate, to Nate Diaz, yeah. and mm-hmm. everything on that particular fight is blamed on the fact that McGregor, at very short notice, has to move up in weight because an opponent falls out of bed. But if you look at Diaz's body, and you and I look at fighters' bodies all the time. Diaz looks like he's had to crash the weight to get his name on that lucrative contract. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, so, so everyone's looking at oh, the fact that McGregor steps up. No, as far as I can make out, as far as I can make out, Diaz looks like he was on, two, he was on vacation in Mexico two weeks before he gets a call to fight for probably ten times whatever he made previously. But here's the problem, Nate. You've got to get down to 200 pounds, 170 pounds, 180 pounds. And he would have said in his head, but I'm 230 at the moment. I'm eating hot dogs and drinking beer in Mexico, kicking back in Tijuana. Yeah. He lost the weight, but, and he looked, he looked dreadful physically. So we, we, we're, we're all giving uh, McGregor a break in that fight because he stepped up in weight. What about the guy that smashed him to bits, who had to, I reckon, probably lost a stone? in two weeks if you yeah. have a look at his body yeah. Mike listen we, 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 we forgot to do this um, last week talking there is British interest on the bill yeah quite yeah. heavy interest yeah and I like I like the fight I, I think potentially it could be the fight that we're talking about as the best contest afterwards Nathan Cleverly against Badu Jack Badu Jack you know and I was here for Badu Jack against or over in Brooklyn for Badu Jack against James DeGale earlier in the year I like Badu Jack. I mean, he does nothing spectacularly, but he's very, very strong. He'll be in front of Cleverly the whole time. I see this, Steve, as, as very similar to Cleverly over here in the States in Chicago a couple of years ago against the pole, the teak tough pole, Andre Fonfara. Yeah. Great fight, great fight. I actually very never thought fight. Cleverly was going to win that fight. Might have been a career shortening fight for Cleverly. I know he's come he had back. Yeah, he had a year off though after it as and well. I, so I, you're, I, know you're right. I know he's got this sawn off version of the WBA light heavyweight title, but I, I just, I just see this as a as a fascinating clash of stars. I think it could be the fight of the undercard. Can I just give you a stat? Um, I, I tell you, I did some work today. I might have a night off, which is an odd thing to say in Las Vegas. I might actually go to bed in a moment at about nine o'clock or whatever it is. His last four fights, Badu Jack. Okay. Four of them all got the points. He hasn't lost any. There's a disqualification because his opponent found a drug test afterwards and the fight was a draw. There's another draw. There's a split and a majority draw. So that means if there's four, if there's four fights, that means there's a total of 12 judges who've scored his last four fights. That's 12 judges. How many of those 12 judges do you think scored for Badu Jack, who, as you say, <laughs> does nothing exceptionally but does everything well? How many of the 12 do you think have scored for Five. Five of the twelve. <laughs> the, the, man, the man has clung on to world titles by a sliver. George Groves and James DeGaulle are still fuming. Uh, decisions not going their way. OK, let's wrap this up, Mike. Um, 
every single day. Uh, the plan is we're going to record every day after the fight, uh, week events, official arrivals on Tuesday, the grand arrivals they call it. Wednesday and Thursday, press conferences, the weigh-in on Friday, which will be fantastic, and then, of course, the fight on Friday night. And all of these things will be happening over overnight in the UK, so the podcast will be there first thing in the morning when you wake up, and we'll bring you up to date with whatever's happened. Now, if you subscribe to the podcast, you can do whatever you want, and it'll just be there in the morning. It's quite simple. You don't have to go and chase it. It'll be waiting for you. Now... Just to say, if you're listening to this and you're a mad MMA fan, we will involve some of the others, people from the, the mixed martial arts business, the UFC business. But I can assure you, if they sit there in front of me and say that McGregor's going to knock him out with a double loose sling back, I'm going to actually ask them to stand up and demonstrate the punch. <laughs> I am, Mike. I'm sorry. I don't really care. I still- <laughs> so, you know, we've got to get some of those guys in and they can do it to your face. They, I want them to say, no, it's not going to happen. But you know what, Steve? When we were talking that night, when the fight was announced to Phil Williams about half past 11 at night, even then, as we were chuckling down the line, I didn't think we'd get here, but we're here in Vegas. And if ever a fight belonged in Las Vegas, yes. this is the one, isn't it? If ever there was a... A fight that not only belonged in Vegas but was made for Vegas, and a fight that the alternative ending, i.e., McGregor wins, that that could only happen in the fantasy land that is Vegas. If this, I swear, if this fight was happening in Tucson, Arizona, there'd only be one winner. If it was happening in Omaha, Nebraska, there'd only be one winner. In Dayton, Ohio, there'd only be one winner. In Barnsley, in Catford, anywhere in the world, there'd only be one winner. This is probably the only city in the world where there possibly could be an alternative <laughs> result. And don't forget, commentary on Five Live, Saturday night here in Vegas, Sunday morning in the UK. We reckon around 4 a.m., but do you remember Mayweather and Pacquiao? Didn't Very start late. till gone five because so many people were buying the pay-per-view that they had to delay the start of the fight. I wouldn't be surprised if exactly the same happened here. And they, they had 4.6 million domestic sales, uh, American sales, $99 plus local tax. Some, in some states, it's $130. They want to ring every single sale out. They might even go later. We could have a fight that starts when it's breakfast time in the UK, about 10 to 9 in the morning. Who knows? We're going to be daily. From different restaurants, different bars, ringside events and gyms here from Las Vegas. I'm Bunce, it's Costello, it's BBC Five Live. On digital and online. This is BBC Radio Five Live. BBC.co.uk slash Five Live.